Here we go. Yay. Oh my goodness, so many people. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm going to be your interpreter today, or tonight, rather. Oh, wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> oh. me just fine hear me just fine or no actually you cut out a little bit okay I don't think that I'll be voicing it. me okay your screen is freezing a bit mm-hmm mm, okay strange but it seems better now Okay, better now? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Welcome. Hey, I'm Gwen, I'm Will with just... Communication Plus. Um, just real quick, um, tonight, will everybody that's in the meeting, that's here for the reading, will they be in attendance or will it just be the people participating in the reading? What's that going to look like as far as layout on the screen? Oh, we would mostly all have our cameras off unless we're reading. Okay, perfect. So in what we'll do in case we need to switch, if Megan lets me know that she needs a team, then I'll come in and then I can turn my camera off until she's ready to switch. Megan, you can turn yours off and then I'll turn mine on when you turn yours off. Does that work if we need it? Does that sound like a plan for you? Okay, good deal. Yeah, that's, right. that's good for me. Yeah, perfect. Okay, sounds good, great. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect. Megan, if you need anything, let me know, okay? Okay, thank, thank you. you. You bet, thanks, have a good night. Thank you. So should we plan on turning our cameras off when we're not well, reading? For you guys, um, and I don't know who's in Yes. Sorry, some, you, someone just cut out. Okay, um, I, I'm not sure who's in charge um, for tonight's event, um, but do you, you who will be speaking? Um, I'll, I'll be speaking for the general introduction and then Molly will be speaking for the uh, feature bios. Okay. And then what about the readings? Is there a specific order for readings? There is a specific order for readings. Uh, we're going to post that in the chat during the introduction. Okay. Um, it should just okay. be in the order of the document, though, which we'll also have a link I to. I have three. So I didn't know there. if. Oh, I have three documents. I have one that says August opening readers, and then I have, um, I guess, spotlights from Mulberg and Catherine. Um, yeah, um, Jenny and Catherine are the featured readers, and then the opening readers uh, we're going to do first. Okay, so it's going to be opening readers, and then um and me Catherine is that correct oh so it's Catherine then Jenny Jenny then Catherine got it perfect thank you so much yeah thank you Cool. Well, um, oh, I have to admit some more people. How's everybody doing? I'm so excited about all of these people. Yay.
Hello. I'm trying to figure out how to do this for my phone because my computer was acting up, but it's good to see all's faces. So good to see you. Yay. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm just like focusing on letting people in and my brain is in two places at once. So Gwen, do you want us to go ahead and um, turn off our video or Peter? Uh, we're going to get started in probably about maybe five to 10 minutes or so. Um, so once we get started, definitely. Um, and, but you know, the next five to 10, I, th I think it's, it's fine to just kind of chat and hang out. Okay. Yeah, I think we're still waiting for some more people to come who are reading. So if we just like say hi for a second, then they'll get here. So, hi. How is everybody? Terrible? Medium? I'm hanging in. Um, out of curiosity, can people, it says recording, can people see me like awkwardly chain smoking on my porch right now? Or is that just the people in the Zoom? <laughs> and we can just see your face. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> we should all be awkwardly chain smoking at this point. Yeah. <laughs> I would join you. My heart is awkwardly chain smoking. <laughs> I'm awkwardly drinking a beer. That's similar. <laughs> I <can't>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know I keep having to like look back and forth to let people in I'm trying to like put this somewhere where it sits still there we go you know I'd love to hear where people are so I'm in um, Prairie Village it's a suburb of Kansas City nice I'm in Arkansas I'm in Fayetteville I'm in Frogtown, which is a neighborhood in St. Paul. I'm in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. Oh, neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also in Kansas City. I'm also in Kansas City uh, in my bed drinking a can of wine and hiding from my family. Yes. Hi, Erin. <laughs> Hi, Kate. <laughs> Hi, Erin. <laughs> Pretty on brand, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Aaron, I hope you have some extra cans for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot of a lot of that happening. <laughs> a glass is just not enough anymore. <laughs> it's too dangerous. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm calling in from Los Angeles. Oh wow. Is it sunny and beautiful? It's also like a hundred degrees. So. Oh, <laughs> that's comforting. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you have AC. I visited my friend in LA last summer and there was no AC and it was a little rough. And not central, but I can sit close to the units. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> It's been really cool to have people show up from, from different places. I, I mentioned this earlier in the workshop, um, but it's been really neat to be able to, to have people um, join us who wouldn't otherwise be able to be here. So thanks, thanks everyone for being here from elsewhere. I'm in Amish country. 
uh, South Central Pennsylvania near Philly. Oh, what part? I used to live in uh, McCungy and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I live near Lancaster. Yeah. Have you put a hex sign on your house yet? Say it again. Have you put a hex sign on your house yet? One of those, um, no, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, yeah, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Meg, it's good to see you. <laughs> Hi, yeah, it's very popular. In this I area. really wanted one for my barn in Ohio when we lived there. Um, I wanted to get the Good luck, Distal Fink Bird was uh, the one I was in love with. I'll write in the chat. Oh, I don't think I've seen that. Um, it's like a deformed peacock. <laughs> uh, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to need more information later. <laughs> it sounds like something I need. It's just a... Um, yeah, so in, I guess in Pennsylvania Dutch country, there was um, this old German tradition of folk magic, um, and there's all these um, uh, icons or symbolic images. Um, I'm trying to think, there's like tulips and um, just like X's and different geometric shapes, and they all are meant to like have like a different charm over the property. Um, and so there's this one of this like, um, really unusual looking bird that I think is particularly cool that um, is called the distal fink bird and it's her good luck. I wonder what distal fink means. I know I feel like I knew that when I was hanging out on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> well in medicine distal means lower right so it must be like lower something. Oh. Lower fink. Thing. <laughs> That's a great name for a book. <laughs> yes. Oh, we have it in oh. the chat. <laughs> oh, wow. Thanks, Carolyn. <laughs> Hi, Marcus. Nice to see you. Hey, Kate. Really good to see you. It's been a while. Yeah. I feel like all of Kansas City is on this Zoom right now. Yeah, right. Got the writer's, the writer's place online oh. right now. Bridget just turned on her camera to represent. Yeah. Hi, Bridget. Hi, Marcus. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. Going back to work tomorrow though, a little nervous about it. Same. Oh. <laughs> Is your, are you at the high school, Marcus? Yeah, yeah, I'm at North Kansas City High School. Are they on like hybrid or? or? Well, parents got a choice. They could keep their, their kids home or send them. 
And so I guess that's what's best if we have to go for the, for the funding. <laughs> uh, yeah, the HEALS Act stipulates that um, we go face to face at least 50% of the time or offer that. And so, um, yeah, in order to get funding, I mean, that, that hasn't passed yet, but, but I think our district is anticipating that. Yeah, so. I'm sorry, you have to yeah. face that risk. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to it. I've got a I've got a class of 31, um, so most likely, you know, most likely a third of those students will stay home. But still, um, you know, the, the physical space of the room just will not keep us far enough apart to be safe. Yes, yeah, so I'm a right. little concerned about it. We are we're all concerned about it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. does that mean you also have to teach online uh, or? Yeah, we're supposed to flip our classrooms, which means that our instruction will go onto video so that students at home can um, access it. So, yeah, but we, we were already putting most of our course content onto Canvas. So it's not like that's not going to be anything new. I mean, I was already doing that. The, the video lessons will be time consuming because they don't have any way for us to record them in the classroom. So. Oh, so you have to record them again afterwards? Yeah, that's sort of, well, that's sort of the expectation in some of these classes. Like I teach some, a, some AP classes. And so that'll be, parents will sort of expect that. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's just in the culture sort of, you know, so. There's some serious workload issues happening. Yeah. You, for you too? Uh, yes, but I am fortunate and do not have my, my, I got my students to agree to be online. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, our, our campus is kind of depends on the situation. Some folks are having to teach in person, um, even despite like, um, ADA yeah. or yeah, it's not great. No. <laughs> Sounds like a real mess. I, um, I'm sorry that y'all are having to do that. Um, hopefully something that will be great is this reading, <laughs> which I think it's time to get started with. Um, and I think Pete is going to kick us off with introductions. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Open Mouth Reading Series. Um, quick image description of me for anyone um, with visual needs, impairments, what have you. Uh, I'm uh, wearing a headset. I have kind of short on the side hair, I'm white, uh, beard that's like medium length, brown eyes, gray shirt. Uh, I'm in my apartment. Um, which has like wooden doors on the back and kind of like a beige wall, very basic and boring and cheap to live in, which is nice. Um, and so, yeah, welcome. This is our second um, online uh, installment of this series. We have an ASL interpreter here, uh, Megan Beatty. I know for Zoom, you might not be able to see everyone uh, at once because of the amount of people in here, but you should have like a one out of two tab. So if um, you need uh, Megan and um, her name is interpreter on here, um, find her uh, on her portrait. Um, she should be one of the only people that you should be able to see. Um, so, but yeah, we're the Open Mouth Reading Series, a nonprofit literary organization based in Fayetteville. We host a monthly poetry reading and workshop with our visiting writers, as well as an annual retreat and festival. The one this year obviously is delayed till next year. Uh, our goal is to bring local poets and poetry lovers in contact with nationally touring poets and create greater community through writing. At each of our readings, we have an opening round of 10 or so community readers who read a single poem each in rapid succession, either their own poems or a poem by someone else that they love. 
uh, slots for this evening are full, but we are always excited to have new opening readers. So let us know if you'd like to read at a future event. Uh, you can get more information about future events on our website, um, which is openmouthreadings.com. Uh, we also post on Facebook and Twitter and social media things. Um, we are a nonprofit and we're volunteer. Uh, any money that we make goes to paying our poets. We pay all of our poets, um, all of our featured poets, I, I should say, uh, and we're taking steps to increase accessibility permanently by continuing to post reading and workshop content online at our Patreon account and by providing captioning services and access to access copies at workshops and readings and ASL interpretation at readings. Um, you can read more about what we're doing to increase accessibility of the literary landscape on our website. Um, you can also support this work by signing up to give up to us regularly, maybe. Um, or if you wanna make a single donation, um, also you don't have to, right? Just by joining us and coming to our events. Uh, we love you and we're so glad we're here. Thank you so much. Um, quick accessibility statement. Uh, we've been working to make our programs more accessible for this new online format and when we are able to have in-person readings and workshops again. Uh, we're taking steps to provide captioning for Zoom readings and workshops, providing ASL interpreters, as well as conducting and offering visual aid materials. Uh, we've also just completed a course with an accessibility consultant to better understand and apply the principles of accessible design. We are very excited about the potential for access and online format opens up. And because of this new format, we are able to reach people who might not otherwise be able to make our events because everything from distance to immune issues to physical access challenges. Uh, even when we return to an in-person format, which we won't do until there's a vaccine for COVID-19, we are working to ensure we are, uh, that we only work with accessible spaces. And we now plan to make sure all of our readings and workshops are simultaneously cast online. Uh, workshops will be made available on our YouTube for one month and thereafter will be available for a small fee on our Patreon. Just, you know, if you donate, then you have access after that one month period. Um, some things that you can do to make sure uh, and help us ensure that the space remains accessible is to mute your microphone when you are not speaking to help cut down on distractions and background noise. Share your pronouns by editing your name to include that. You can do that by, if you go to your um, video portrait, there's gonna be dot, dot, dot. And if you click on that, you can go to rename. Um, Please give a content warning uh, if what you're about to include uh, or share might cause someone else discomfort. Um, when the ASL interpreter is present and doing the great work, uh, turn off your ca camera unless you're speaking. Uh, so that's easier for those who need to focus on the ASL interpreter as well as the reader. Uh, remember that this is your space to use respectfully as you need. Uh, you're free to turn off your camera, use the chat function, or make requests as you need, uh, and look for links to access copies in the chat. We're going to have access copies, uh, also copies of all the poems for opening readers, um, and many other links that should be helpful. Um, so we're going to start this with opening readers, and then we're going to go into our features. Um, Catherine and Jenny, who are, we're very excited to have with us. Um, so for opening readers, the order is going to be Anna, Caroline, Victoria, uh, Vasantha, Romy, Miles, Hejun, Brody, and Josh. And I think Gwen will be posting the list in the chat. And with that, I'll hand it over to Anna. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Um, I was an attendee of the retreat in 2018 and just adored the space for its care and accessibility. So I'm excited to get to be here with you guys again from Minnesota. Um, a content note for this poem, it's going to talk about hospitalization, some medical stuff, um, death, uh, reference to sexual assault. So whatever you need to do to take care of yourselves, please do. Visitation. Because of the pandemic, no family was allowed. Three days of masks rolled out in front of me in the somber Catholic light of St. Mary's Hospital. Visitors, though, have never had any trouble finding me. Two. A twisted road in Granville, 
the doe's mirrored fracture, an antlered witness so still I worry the circling vultures will mistake living flesh for a meal. My living flesh feels like a meal, searching for a sharp beak, a talon to unhook facts from fascia, as though muscle was the myth. Three. The shadow figures are never on my chest when I wake up roadkill in process. They just point from the corner, the doorway, the foot of the bed. In the dark, without my glasses, any one of them could be Alex, could be holding a gun, could be again walking to lock that bedroom door. Four. On the anniversary of Jan's death, I dream the anniversary of her death. The house is abandoned boardwalk carnival. The lake is dirty. She can call us on the phone today. The reception crystal as I tell her, her sons still laugh. I only dream of her when I dream of muddy water. Five. Remember that scene in Hercules when he has to dive into the green swirl of the fates cut threads to save Meg? That's how the ketamine kicked in. Emerald circling flock as the table slid forward for the fluoroscope. I dove in, every dead hand in the dead world to pull memory from my body in bloody chunks. Six, sometimes I forget she died. Sometimes I forget I didn't. Sometimes death visits me and I remember as I watch it walk away. Thanks guys. So I guess I just roll on, on in, I think. Okay, so I'm Caroline. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I am from Little Rock, Arkansas, and I'm gonna read a poem that's from my chat book that just became available for pre-order with Sibling Rivalry Press, which is a press out of Little Rock. Um, and it's called Ode to the Word Lesbian. They say you take up too much space in the mouth. All those awkward syllables fighting to be pronounced, the heavy L, the way the tongue must meet teeth to birth you. I once took you out of a slide about Audre Lorde because my students laughter at your mention was so disruptive, black, lesbian, mother, warrior, poet. I recited her quote about silence, the one that ends it's better to speak and ignored the irony of my censorship, lesbian, often rejected for sounding clinical, your sound more like a diagnosis or medication with a slew of undesirable side effects. In 1925, you were a noun that meant the female equivalent of a sodomite, an inversion. When I was 13 and growth spurted above my classmates, a well-meaning man came up to us in the grocery store and told my father, someday a tall man is going to come and take her away from you. How could he ever have imagined you? The third section of your definition reads erotic, sensual, as if you are X-rated, a word that must be whispered, much too shameful to be said in broad daylight, porn shoved under the mattress. In high school, a boy told me the locker room was littered with rumors that I was a lesbian. The baseball team decided it was hot, okay, as long as you looked like a boy could still insert himself in the fantasy. I have to mention your motherland. Lesbos, surrounded by salt slick water with Sappho and her anguished love poems, and don't we all live there or wish we did? An island of women who wear crowns of mouths that don't know how to quiet, who damn the uncomfortable, who own men nothing, who own their desire. Knots, my scream, my hair, my hair, my hair. The lice comb sings its own doomed verse, shirk, 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 the sewer music of snakes and grass. Shirk, shirk. Papa comes home and ruffles my hair. Little critters, he said, pointing as one runs across my shoulder. Not enough hair for that, he says, and kneels down to show the bald of his penny bronze head. Ma, Papa, and me, hunched in front of the mirror on a hunt for eggs. Ma picks one out, translucent, pearly. She fixes it between her favored fingernails, mortar and pestle, and presses. It cracks like a nut. There, she says. That's how you know the lice were there, and now they're dead. I imagine whole families curled inside, mother and father yokes. 
I wonder if they felt the nail and wept or just gave out a little creak while dying. Did Demi think of these things? I wonder. We were the same down to the texture of our hair, stern, tire black, thick like rubber. Maybe her mother also pulled a mean comb through her hair after we played. Little critters, her and me, winding in and out of the tube slide, the class carpet grime. Ma taps out the comb on the sink, tick, tick, a small rain of lice. She turns on the tub faucet for my final rinse. I cry, bring the water my burning bush of hair, and wonder when Demi and I will bump heads again. Thanks so much. Hi, um, I'm gonna read a poem by Gabriela Mistral, translated from the Spanish. The Other. I killed a woman in me, one I never liked. She was the burning bloom of mountain cactus. She was dry earth and fire that never dampens. Stones and sky bowed to her. The horizon was her mantle. She never lowered herself to seek a cooling spring. Wherever she rested, wild grass would twist from her hot breath, the bright coals of her face. Each word she spoke cooled to amber as it left her mouth, not rising free as words should. Mountain plants do not bend, but I bent to her. At her side, I bent and bent. I left her to die, ripped her from deep inside where she had fed like an eagle on my heart. Her beating wings stilled, she bent, a dimmed ember which fell into my hand. Her sisters wail for me still and plead with, her sisters wail for her still and plead with me, the dying fire claws at my skirt when I pass. I snap at them, if you miss her so, go gather up her broken bones, make a new eagle from clay, and if you can't do it, too bad, I killed her. Now you must do the same. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Miles Taylor. Pronouns are they, them. And um, I am um, went to the open mouth retreat last year. I guess that was last year. Feels like more than that. But uh, hi. Um, cool. I'm going to read a poem that was just published in Up the Staircase Quarterly's 50th issue. Um, which I'm very happy to be in. Um, I haven't written really like at all this quarantine, except I wrote this like right before quarantine started and I'm trying to keep hold of that amount of optimism and joy that I had once thinking that hopefully we will gain it again. Um, cool. There is a woman looping longhand on this train and I think she must be a poet. And I glance outside at the students, saddle seated on the stone tops, and I think they must be poets, every one of them, just by the look on their fresh faces at the well-placed street trees. And I look at the Boston trees and they're poets. Just uh, here to dress the world up, they tell us, but they actually create our oxygen. That's too on the nose. The gray-haired lady on the stationary bike absolutely going at it is a poet, no contest. I am definitely a poet at this gym because I have no idea what I'm doing right now. And hark, another goddamn poet, the trainer, speaking softly at the woman in the corner. Every tenderness is a poet as every tender moment I think could be a poem and I'm leaving, walking home and the whole train line is a poet and my one bum knee and my one peeling knuckle and this one fat robin and fucking February is a poet, guaranteed. And I think my favorite poet is when my cat curls his two paws inward like a little bow tie. And my testosterone syringe is a poet. And the espresso machine at my dumb job is a poet. And whoever's in the dish pit is a poet. A poet is anything I could ask. Do you ever feel like a hole in your chest? And every time you think about it, it rips open a little more. 
You ever try to fill it with dopamine and nutrients and you are so close to stuffing it with all the decisions you've said you'd never make, but the poets, all the poets, somehow they are still going, feeling the parameters of that hole. And do you ever realize it opened before you thought about it? You just correlate causation and it could be opening further any day you're not looking at it. Schrodinger's hole at any size at all if you go on about your day, but oh, my poets, my poets pulling it closed with two hands, I love you. This ugly world and this uglier city. This beautiful city and my ugly brain, you make it stop sometimes. I'm trying not to look, but I think you do. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Hedgehog Cook. I was so lucky to be at Open Mouth last fall for part of their festival. And so, and I love Jenny and uh, Kate. So I was really happy that I get to be part of this opening today. Um, oh, just for the visual side, I'm Asian. I have black hair with a little bit of silver in it and a ponytail and glasses. And I'm wearing a shirt that says, The Cranky Poets. <clears throat> I'm gonna read a poem called Not This. Not this, but whatever is rising. The wind, a song, water from a wellspring. The many, the divisible, at the together like you, I. Double-edged blades of grass, sharpening the air in January. Steam exhaled by city streets and the warm loaf of bread in your hands. Meanwhile, a hard, killing frost, plums discarded, yellow gauge, black damson, red heart, their skins bursting, dripping. Justice didn't care, nor the sweet. I refuse the precarity of the line. Such indifference, hold. Hold instead tenderness, the furies, dear lost ones, your many names in my mouth. All I want, clarity, a sword of winter light, the many undivided, our voices keen. Thank you. Hi. Sorry, I'm on my phone, so this is complicated. But hi, I'm Brody Parrish Craig. Um, I use they, them pronouns. And this is an excerpt from a super long seven page poem about playing pianos in a psych ward. <laughs> I speak in cross wires. I am limited to the memorial of language. I'm lucky when I realize that the staff can't understand me if I speak French. I'm so lucky that I disappear. And you don't know me as the maple road, only as heady tongue vibration, pills as ominous communion rolled beneath the wafered tongues. We play our soul possession and the house goes crazy flipping dominoes. We never were the lepers, but your mind kept riding home. Your notion sin to consider sameness as attraction. Do you remember when I fed you cilantro from my fork? That one calm in the cafeteria, the shuffle tender as you laughed, and we both laughed your Bible off as joy again, a moment when my mind stopped jumping itself off the roof. Two months now, the piano held those power lines. I'll end this trauma's war and I'll return. The institution's plastic liminal now and then forget just for a moment what pissed me off. The metal toilet and the bad photos of trees we couldn't touch less keep. Despite this prolonged glance, I heard you and your body's meditative bowl. The small of hours after transport took me out, I asked what drained you to. Stolen as we enter this contact nebulous, I see you now and again. Keep in mind our blown glass knees. What healed and prayed your body into silence, mine in stillness. Without fear along God's grain, 
I hope you hold what's close, take notes. Your Bible studies I reteached, I untranslated. The words another's voice pitched wrong and you let go of. The queer inside you held like terror, held onto the Bible by your bed. I hope you return home and recall worship music. Praise we played those hymns. I hope you better yet possess your own piano. I hope your future boyfriend drums better than I could on psych ward stools, that you keep the naked ear from way back when we tuned the furniture awake, or at least that when the music swims you back to you again, that if all else you feel what braided sound from keys to hands, each open palm as psalm what moves the past beyond the throat. I hope you hold the note so long that the sound unblocks every door you know your future possible as a newly unbarred window. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I am Josh. He's he, him pronouns. And uh, this poem is um, actually, it's, it's like in two voices, which now is occurring to me as a weird poem to read on a video reading. Um, but this is how this is how people give directions where I came from, and probably anybody that's from a very rural place. Maybe it's something like this. But so the speaker that starts the poem is Phil, and he's giving you directions. And then there's the speaker of the poem. So it's called "You're Invited If You Come Out." Remember where J.W. put the boat in that time we went to Cobb Island with Johnny and Dale and them, where Cecil had them crab pots? Whenever you pass that turn, just keep on going. It's always like this, asking Phil directions. Did you ever know Tyler Crockett's cousin used to throw parties up by Gargatha, worked at Wallops? Phil hunts for what the two of you might have in common. Shit, I know you know the Crockett's lived in that old ass house behind the tracks. Phil maybe thinks if you remembered all the things he does, you'd both be there already. Look, it's Tyler's cousin's buddy's house. Just call me when you get there. Ain't like he'll care. Whatever you assume regarding Phil's directions, that part's true. There is no need to know the host beforehand. Since once you're there, you're there. And by the time you're down in natty lights around a bonfire, the names of roads you came on matter not. But that gets back to the trouble at hand to Phil, your guide on the phone, his voice originating in either Accomack or Northampton County. Well, look, you'll see my truck if we end up getting there first, Phil says, providing you with one last marker on the map he's charting of this place made less, perhaps, of land than memory. I love that, Josh. Um, I know that kind of giving directions very well. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Molly Best Rector. I am the director of Open Mouth Reading Series. Um, and I'm going to introduce our featured poets. But first, um, does any, do, do we need a break between the opening readers and the, and the featured readers? Tell me in the chat or. Give me a thumbs up. Okay, let's take just like a, it's 7.44. Let's take a break for like, is three minutes okay? Okay, let's take a three minute break. I'll see you back here at 7.47, a nice round number. Thank you to all of our opening reading readers. Um, also, yeah, Miles, uh, sorry, 8.47 if you're on Eastern time and uh, 5.47 if you're in California. Is that right?
All right, friends, it's 747. Are you back? I love seeing these thumbs pop up. <laughs> okay, um, well, I am going to introduce Jenny first. Um, Jenny is going to be the first reader. And then after Jenny, I'll introduce Kate. Um, and we'll just read some poems together. Um, so earlier, we had a workshop about world building. Um, and in it, we talked a little bit about negation. Um, and I, as, as I was thinking about that, I, I thought it made a lot of sense for Jenny's book, um, Refusal. Um, there's, there's a lot of power in the idea of refusal and the ability to refuse. Um, and I think that that power is also the power to build worlds. Um, so I think just as Jenny reads, um, one thing that's really good to, to pay attention to is just how everything that gets pushed aside is, is making room for building another world um, and maybe a world that we'd rather be in. Um, so I'll tell you her bio and then invite her to read. Um, and again, thank you to our interpreter and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, we're really excited and grateful to be able to host this reading and, and other readings in the future like it. Um, so Jenny Malberg is the author of two poetry collections, Marvels of the Invisible, winner of the Berkshire Prize, Tupelo Press, and Refusal, LSU Press. She's received fellowships and scholarships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Sewanee Writers Conference, Vermont Studio Center, and the Longleaf Writers Conference. Her work has recently appeared or is forthcoming in Plowshares, Gulf Coast, Tupelo Quarterly, Boulevard, the Missouri Review, West Branch, Poetry Northwest, and other publications. She's Associate Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Central Missouri, where she directs Pleiades Press and co-edits Pleiades Magazine. You can find her online at jennymalberg.com, and I'll post that in the chat. So thank you so much for being here, Jenny. I'm excited to hear you read. Hi, thank you, Molly. Um, I'm Jenny. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and thank you so much to all the incredible readers. Um, I feel so regenerated by your poems, so thank you. Um, and thank you to our interpreter, Molly again, and Gwen and Pete for hosting us. Um, and a special thank you to Kate for your poems and for your friendship. I'm so lucky to share this space with you. Um, I also wanna, wanna thank those of you who are in our workshop this afternoon. During this time, uh, a phrase that no doubt is going to make some white man rich, uh, <laughs> Jeff Bezos, our university administrators. Um, I know we've all been struggling. This week has been really hard for me and um, I've felt challenged by how much I can handle. But today in the workshop and, and this evening, um, you all reminded me that my poetry people are here to hold me. So I'm really grateful to you all. Um, today in our workshop, we discussed imagining worlds, as Molly said, for our poems. Um, worlds in which the impossible is possible. Worlds that allow us to have a voice when we feel voiceless. Sometimes that's experience, experimenting and writing um, in the voices of our oppressors to take the power out of their words. Um, sometimes it's creating worlds that negate or erase our traumas. Um, Speaking of that, I need to give you a content warning. I will read poems tonight that do address uh, issues of domestic violence and abuse. Um, so if you need to step out, please, please do so. Um, so I've centered this reading around those ideas. And I'll start with a poem in which I write in the voice of a man who has abused his position of power, uh, both in the world of a relationship and uh, we hate to see it in the world of poetry. So, sorry, take a sip real quick. <clears throat> Said the poet, you are a frozen pond with fish pulsing beneath, 
Look in the mirror. Say you're beautiful. Why don't you touch me more? Why are you holding yourself? I killed the only pet I ever loved. This isn't yelling. This isn't my definition of yelling. My own father yells until my mother is silent as a sea cave. Asleep, you are my bird underground in a box. I want to touch all your feathers. I swear I'll be better. Wake up. Your friends don't love you. Your family doesn't love you. I am a good person. I am a good poet. Once I stood on the train tracks too long. I am the victim here. I didn't sleep with that student. Marry me. I hated you last night. Be the mother of my children. I have a very good reputation. My, child was, my childhood was dappled with henbit. Why won't you open the door? Why aren't you answering me? You should be ashamed of yourself. You are a cricket. I am the light. Be with me forever. Why are you afraid? Get down on your knees and say you're sorry. Have another drink. Take off your clothes. Try getting angry. It feels so good. The list. A forest opened and there was a table with tea sandwiches and a bright red kettle and God said, have a seat. I had been lost in the woods a long time, running from the man who was trying to kill me. I kept wanting to turn back until I made so many circles I didn't recognize my own feet. All the trees had changed. Now I believed what he'd said. I was crazy, cruel, a child. With feet like fish in the silver light, I stepped around the bodies of deer, strewn across the forest floor as apples. I did not look at the yellow wolves that fed on them. God said, I know you love to read. Her hair was short and she had the gray eyes of my sister. I know how you love language, she said as she poured some tea. The cup was not chipped. When I looked through the leaves, I saw the faces of the children I thought I would have with the man who could not love me. God handed me some paper. Make a list, she said. After each number write, I am. God said, yourself is your context. You know the definitions. You've read every page. Her eyes were moons of invisible planets. I was ready to read my list aloud, but God would not let me. Cross out number five, she said. An arrow landed in my heart. Five, I am a good friend, I had written. The forest narrowed and around the edges of my sight, a blackness crept in. Can anyone do this to you? God asked me. Are you going to let a man do this to you? Cross out number eight, she said. Eight, I deserve to be loved. I could not speak for the pain in my chest. Who is going to do this to you? She was beginning to shout. Who? So uh, one thing that I did when I was writing Refusal was to get super into Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I tried writing in the voice of a monster to get closer to understanding the ways in which I had been victimized. Um, I discovered that the Demogorgon, who you might recognize from Stranger Things if you're not a D&D player, um, actually has a rich history in literature. So you might recognize that in, in these next couple of poems. This is Love Song of the Demogorgon, and it begins with an epigraph um, from Shelley's Prometheus Unbound, which reads, Hither the sound has borne us to the realm of Demogorgon and the mighty portal. The Love Song of Demogorgon. Love is the world reversed. Nothing but a scribble in a drizzling cave. Good Christians do not speak my name, but still I rise inside your body, slither amphibian from your lips. Don't look at me, I'm chaos. Despite the bit of earth left in me, I resemble nothing. Face like a starfish, 
fingers like rodents in flight. My mind made of two minds, I change, two-headed ruler of a twofold world. The higher mind flays me, that shadow box I play inside, I, its mean puppet, moving by night. Come for me with your nail-studded bat. I will make you do the most terrible things. Okay, hoping for some comic relief with this next one. Um, this is Portrait of Demogorgon as Poet. You all might recognize this figure. <laughs> We've all been at writers' conferences, right? Okay, Portrait of Demogorgon as Poet. The Prince of Demons attends a writers' conference. He travels all the way from the 88th abyss to some woods in America. The Prince of Demons doesn't forget his weed and his condoms, which are only for show. He plans to impregnate everyone. He is workshopping his poem about Ferguson, which he heard about on human TV. The Prince of Demons' perspective on this matter is very important because hate makes him blush in a good way. Anyway, his poem has a megaphone, so he hears nothing but his own voice. His poem makes the workshop feel afraid. To avoid a violent flaying, not critiquing the Prince of Demons poems is advised. In his one mind, the Prince of Demons wants so badly to be good, or at least liked, but a softy monster never got anywhere, as his father the king used to say. At the craft lecture, the Prince of Demons doodles little drawings of light bulbs and naked women. He sits mostly alone at dinner, shaking his head, chuckling to himself, face unfurling like a corpse flower, exposing his many sharp teeth. Fools, he thinks, all of them fools. Don't they know Voltaire named him creator of Earth? that Milton dreaded him, that he is Melville's white whale, that his very name is taboo. He cries like a man goat and closes his face as a fist. There, there, demon prince, it's not your fault. It is we who opened the portal, who brought you here in the first place. It's because we worshiped you that you grew so strong. So I'll just read two more poems. Um, and so another thing I did while I was writing Refusal was to think about the characters I loved in literature whose stories weren't um, fully being told. I read a scholar who, who said that without Hamlet, Ophelia has no story. And I thought, what a crock of shit. Um, so I transcribed all of Ophelia's lines on their own. And what I discovered was that there, that was a story of gaslighting. Um, a story of a woman being robbed of her own narrative. So um, that's kind of what I'm thinking about as I read these last two poems. Loving Ophelia is. Loving Ophelia is loving a ghost. And loving a ghost is loving yourself. And loving yourself is a sudden sorrow. And a sudden sorrow is the place where the river pools. And the place where the river pools is not suicide. And not suicide is confronting the unknown. And confronting the unknown is the active condition of womanhood. And the active condition of womanhood is the beauteous nature of Denmark. And the beauteous nature of Denmark is lovesickness. And lovesickness is obsession with a version of yourself. An obsession with a version of yourself is egomania. An egomania is a room of mirrors. And a room of mirrors is love and hate simultaneously. And love and hate simultaneously is the trick of abuse. And the trick of abuse is a vexation of the mind. And a vexation of the mind is the feeble dawn of gaslight and tea. And the feeble dawn of gaslight and tea is an overbearing husband. And an overbearing husband is a soliloquy of cliches. And a soliloquy of cliches is the misery of scholars. And the misery of scholars is an old friend's skull. And an old friend's skull is a sudden sorrow. And a sudden sorrow is holding one's breath. 
and holding one's breath is swimming away, and swimming away is the other shore on which Ophelia has woken. Um, so finally, I, I, what I did, I, I placed Ophelia um, in the same world as the Demogorgon, so they sort of have this like epic battle, um, so that Ophelia could reclaim her own agency. Um, so I'll end this reading tonight with um, the end of their story in the book. This is Ophelia slays Demogorgon. The dog will have his day as some dude once said, and this is it. I return to my brook, pockets full of rue, wade in until its cold hands cup my ankles, my hips, my breasts, my neck, till my hair fans around me like, what else, a fan. This isn't meant to be pretty. All Ophelia as muse, all Ophelia's poetic death. No one paid me for that. I flip over, this my astral plane, the brook my sensory deprivation chamber. I close my eyes, the water fills my ears. They are not seashells, but ears. I could hold my breath for days. It is here beneath the water I do not float, where the world flips. I cross over, swimming away from my body like a soul. Now I walk. Dark, the floor slick, a sickening sound, a wet tail slapping water. I do not need my hands in the dark. I have already been dead. Come, monster. There he is, kissing the child I never had. No, he is stealing her breath. He infects her. With all my rue, I summon my suicide. The rage, definite as an incision. Come, channel. Come, impossible light. He whines, he curses my name. I've heard it all before. With my mind, I drive into the monster until he breaks. His body bursts, hundreds of black, frantic moths. Then, ash, I am the one who lives. Thank you so much. Every single one of those poems gave me goosebumps. Thank you, Jenny, for, for reading. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so I'm going to introduce Kate. Um, so, so Catherine Nurberger was actually, Open Mouth started in 2018. And for the first several months that, that we were running series, we I and said this person to come here um, invited her so she came in June of 2016 and I was so excited when she reached out to ask to come back because I just absolutely love them. Um, so she's touring with her book Rue I'm sure you'll notice that in Jenny's last poem she used the word Rue a couple of times um, and I love that connection so um, I'll just read Kate's bio and then um, bring her on. Catherine Nerdberger is the author of two previous poetry collections, The End of Pink and Rag and Bone. She has also written a collection of lyric essays, brief interviews with the romantic past. A recipient of fellowships from the NEA, H.J. Andrews Research Forest, American Antiquarian Society, and the Bakken Museum of Electricity and Life, she teaches creative writing at the University of Minnesota. Thank you, Kate, for being here. Thanks for having me back, Molly. I had so much fun hanging out with you um, at that reading a few years ago. Um, and it's really an honor to be here in this space um, with Jenny, whose poems I love so much, and um, all of the readers from the beginning. Those were such fantastic poems, and I'm full of lines, I, ideas for lines now. Um, I also want to thank um, 
Gwen and Peter for um, organizing things today and Megan for interpreting. Um, so I'm going to start um, the reading off. I wrote this book, um, I wrote this book, Rue, about plants historically used for birth control and um, my pissed off feelings about patriarchal bullshit. Um, but really, I mean, that's sort of my elevator pitch for it, but it's really, I would say, a book about loneliness and so social isolation while living in a patriarchal rural place um, and the rage I felt then. Um, to my surprise, in writing this book on the other side of that rage, I thought would be just more rage and then more rage. But um, there was this really, um, there was this possibility of genuine connection and friendships that I, I hadn't really imagined were possible until I got pissed. So um, I guess now that isolation and alienation kind of feel like the order of the day in these times, um, I thought it might be nice to read to you all um, a poem about the unlikely possibilities for connection that sometimes emerge. Um, so this is a poem about a plant historically used for birth control. It's called Regarding Silphium, the birth control of the Roman Empire for 600 years extincted by careless land management in the year 200 AD. When I was just about done being married and he was a blossomed out nerve of seeing himself through the ugly eyes of how I had come to see him and myself for letting our lives get so Tupperware firm molded, for thinking I could lace and pinprick it back with just the right delicacy when a good punch in the face was what a mess this bad required. I know you're thinking a punch in the face is never the answer, but that's the lace talking. When I was just about done with the lace-throated Navy violence, our daughter, who is five, told me how he broke. She didn't say he broke. She said he got really worked up, driving past all the protesters outside Planned Parenthood on Providence Avenue, from which the University Medical School had just withdrawn funding, and also the option for residents to do training.